Hey everyone, Travis here from Travis.media. Every developer should be familiar with the concepts that make up a 12-factor app whether you agree with them or not. If you're a junior developer or you're new in the industry, this information will help you learn why you're doing the things you're probably asked to do already. When I was a brand new developer, I didn't go over this. I didn't read about this. Instead, I just followed what was asked of me by my senior devs regarding environment variables and dependencies and logging, things like that. And eventually I just learned to do these things. But if I would have just went over this up front, I could have been on the same page as my mid to senior developers and my company off the bat and not look like such a newbie. Now the 12 factor app methodology is a set of recommendations that have proven to be successful for web apps or any services deployed on the web. It's a standard of best practices to hold your web app up against. It was drafted by developers over at Heroku and first presented in 2011. If you're currently building an app or running an app or looking to do this in the near future, you'll want to make sure that you consider these as you plan and build. And be sure to listen to all of these because some of these will overlap and you'll see how cohesive these 12 steps can make your application. All that being said, let's look at these one by one. Number one deals with your code base. So your code should be stored in a single version controlled repository and differentiated only by configuration. Your application's code should be in a single code base, not multiple, that would be a distributed system. One app gets one code base, three apps get three code bases. But with this one code base, there are many deploys, such as to dev or staging or production. And a configuration would determine which deploy the code would run. We'll talk more on that in a minute. But code changes are checked into one repo and the build is released to different environments based on configurations. We don't want multiple code bases for one application. Then you'd be out of sync or testing could be difficult. So one app, gets one code base and can serve many deploys from configurations. Number two is dependencies. We need to explicitly declare and isolate dependencies. A 12 factor app never relies on implicit system wide packages. If I'm a new developer and I pull down some Python code, I want my dependencies declared in a requirements.txt file and I want to install them in a virtual environment with virtual env. I don't want to be using any implicit system wide dependencies. This simplifies setup for developers new to the app as everything is declared specifically and explicitly. So explicitly declare and isolate dependencies. Number three, config. Store config in the environment not the code. Now this is how you can have one code base with many deploys or external credentials like an S3 bucket or a DB connection string. If your app stores config variables as constants within the code, then you violated this 12 factor methodology. There must be a strict separation of config from the code. In fact, the test here is whether you could make your code base open source at this moment without compromising any credentials. That's the test. So if you're deploying on Vercel or Azure Pipeline, something like that, you'd store your configuration variables there and then in your code you'd make reference to these configurations and then often locally we'd have a local configuration for development that would not be checked into your version control and of course it would be added to your git ignore so as not to expose them number four is backing services any backing service should be treated as an attached resource now a backing service is any service that the app consumes over the network as part of its normal operations like databases or caching systems or smtp services whether it's local whether it's a third-party service it doesn't matter a deployment should be able to swap out a local database with a third party managed database with no changes to the code because it's an attached resource, which means they are loosely coupled to the deploy they're attached to. If a database is having some issues and a DB admin spins up a brand new one from a backup, you should be able to detach the bad DB and attach the new one without any code changes. Another backing service that almost every app needs is an authentication service. And let me tell you about today's sponsor, Propel Auth, and why you need them as your app's complete Auth provider. Propel Auth provides hosted, fully customizable sign up and login pages that can be launched quickly and integrated with a number of easy to use SDKs. This means that you don't have to worry about any login, sign up, or account management flows for your application. Propel Auth provides all of that for you. And all the design here can be customized, including the domain, and the SDK makes it easy to set up authenticated pages and routing. Now, what makes this unique is the robust management Propel Auth provides. 
I can create a new project and instantly configure my login and sign up experience from allowing passwordless login, SSO, along with the look and feel of the forms. Not only is this taken care of for you, but you can define your own user schemas or create specific property fields and even login duration, email confirmations, and multi-factor. Now, a key feature with Propel Auth is that multi-tenancy is built in. There's no additional code needed to group users into organizations. In fact, your customers can invite their own teammates via invite flows, email domain, or SAML. And don't worry, there's custom RBAC options here to keep everyone secure. There are user insights on the dashboard, there's user impersonation features to troubleshoot issues, the project's backed by Y Combinator, and there are regular audits in SOC 2 compliance to assure the security of your users. Propel Auth is free to set up with some great guides to guide you through it. Check out the link below to try it out today. Number five is build, release, run. Strictly differentiate between build and run states. So there are three deploy stages. Number one is a build, which converts a code base into an executable build. Second is the release, which takes the build and combines it with the deploy's current config. So with this, you get a build combined with the configuration for this deployment. And then third, there's the run which runs the app in the execution environment. There must be strict separation between these stages. For example, it should be impossible to make changes to code at runtime because you can't pass those changes back to the build phase. The build stage often happens when your code is deployed and dependencies are installed as part of this build stage. But the runtime execution can happen automatically, like on server reboot or a restart on a crash process. Build it once, run it many times. Number six, process. Execute the app is a stateless process. The app itself should handle no state. Any data that needs to persist must be stored in a stateful backing service, which is usually a database. Think about if your app gets restarted. You don't want your app to lose any data. You want it to fire back up with all of the data from the data source attached to it. So, Remember, the app should be completely stateless. Number seven is port binding. Expose services through ports. Your IP address or your domain, it can be changed or may be different in different environments. Thus, exposing the services of your app to port numbers is easier to manage. So if I'm at IP 23.33.33.33, .33 my MySQL service should be at that IP with a port of 3306. And if I'm at a dev instance at 23.33.33.32, my SQL still at port 3306 because it's been exposed through that port. And the same with localhost, localhost port 3306. Your application should be able to bind itself to a port to handle incoming requests. Number eight is concurrency. Set up services as processes that scale out. Think of your app. Your HTTP requests are handled by a web process and other long running background tasks can be set up and handled by other working processes. And say your app gets lots of users and lots of demand and you'll have to consider scaling it. You're gonna have to add more CPUs and memory and space. This is called vertical scaling and you'll eventually hit a limit with this. So a more modern approach is horizontal scaling where you scale out horizontally, creating more independent Independent processes, maybe behind a load balancer or multiple load balancers, and don't get this confused with threading or async executions within the app. But in a 12-factor app, you set up the services as processes that you can scale out, and you don't need to build this into the app. If your app is stateless and disposable, which we'll talk about in a minute, and possess the other features that we've been talking about, you'll be in a position to scale these processes out into more replicated but organized processes. So set up the services as processes and scale them out. Number nine is disposability, meaning a fast startup in a graceful shutdown of your app. They can be stopped and started at a moment's notice, making them easy to do elastic scaling in rapid deployments based on different configurations. So fast startups are important, but having all critical functionalities present before the app is public to the user, like database connections or network connections, is also important. In addition, when the app shuts down, all connections should be terminated properly not abruptly, allowing current requests to finish, refusing any new requests, and then exiting with the activity logged, AKA a graceful shutdown. For a worker process, perhaps this is returning the remaining jobs in the queue. Overall, there just shouldn't be any sudden death. Think if you're doing horizontal scaling and you need to scale up three processes. You want them to start fast when you do that, but you want them functional as well when they're presented to the user. And if you need to scale back the three processes, meaning that you are killing three of these, you want these to shut down gracefully. This is how you want your app 
to work. Number 10 is dev prod parity, meaning all environments should be as similar as possible. It may take weeks for a developer's code to make it to production, leaving the two environments, dev and prod, not in parity. Or maybe SQLite is being used in development, but then MySQL in production. There's a difference there in parity. A 12-factor app is actually designed for continuous deployment, which fixes what we just mentioned by deploying code often and keeping the resources the same across dev and production. And by the way, continuous deployment means that you're pushing out changes to your code base all the time instead of letting things build up into large chunks periodically and then releasing it or deploying it. If you look at this chart here, here's the traditional app versus the 12 factor app. Time between deploys in a traditional app is weeks. A 12 factor app is hours. We're deploying continuously. And then dev versus production environments in a traditional app is divergent but a 12-factor app is as similar as possible. The 12-factor app discourages different backing services between development and production because the risk almost always outweighs the cost. And these services, the full services, are pretty easy to install locally 99% of the time these days. Number 11 is logging. You should be sending logs to event streams. Logs give us visibility into the behavior of a running app. And we often think of these as being written to a file, which is usually what systems do. However, logs are a continually flowing stream. They're time stamped and they're continuous as long as the app is running. Now, a 12-factor app isn't concerned with writing or managing log files. Instead, each running process should write its event stream unbuffered to standard out which is the default output of a computer programming. So your app should not be writing to a file, but to the standard out, a continuous stream of logs. In local development, this can be seen in your terminal, but in production environments, these should be written to log routers like FluentD. And there are lots of options here for this event stream from log indexing and analysis systems like Splunk or big data warehousing systems like Hadoop. These kind of solutions give you more flexibility in real-time log searching, graphing, alerting, and analysis. But this all begins with your app writing to standard out, not a file. Number 12 is admin processes. These should be ran as one-off and independently. This one is more about managing your application and it states that the app should run management or admin tasks in an identical environment as the app's regular long-running processes. And admin code should ship with the application code to avoid synchronization issues. So these administrative updates should be a one-off and not executed by any other parts of your application. And those are the 12 parts of a 12-factor app. Now it's been about 12 years since this was introduced, but the principles really are timeless. And even as we've advanced more to containerization and running things in Kubernetes, these systems still use the practices from these 12 items. Hope this video was helpful. Were you aware of these when you started coding or programming? Do you think they're still valid today? Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so leave me a comment below. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so, and I'll see you in the next video.